the name out there. Uh, yes. I don't know if you, if you watched him. was on TV. church when you're done. This week we start a brand new series. It's our summer series. <clears throat> it's going to take us all the way through the summer. Take me my mic down just a little bit if you want. I'm getting a little feedback. And uh, it's called Survival of the Fittest. You can see it up there. I, we've got a screen back there as well. Survival of the Fittest. Um, this series came out of, was a follow-up series to our summer series last year, which was as we can learn from Roadkill. If you were here last year, you remember we went through, we went through 10 different animals that I, I actually researched uh, and found the 10 most, I, I don't know if the word is popular, or the 10 most abundant animals that are killed on the road as roadkill. And we analyzed why. Why are they killed? What, what do they do? Like the squirrel. A squirrel is indecisive, right? Anybody ever run over a squirrel and want to admit it in public? Yes. And, all right, one step further. Did you run that over, pick it up, take it home, and have it for dinner? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the squirrel is indecisive. When he gets out in the middle of the road, if you've ever seen a squirrel run out in front of you, he runs one, one back, back and forth and back and forth. That's why squirrels get hit. And we went through and, and talked all about that. And, and uh, as I thought about it and, and prayed, and God just led me to this series. Uh, <clears throat> what we're going to be doing is dealing with safari animals, big game animals, and why they are so popular to be hunted, what their value is, and then what they do to A, um, get bagged, <laughs> and B, protect themselves. What are their evasive measures? And it goes along with the idea that we are prey. And we're going to be talking about that this morning. We are prey. Um, it's a spiritual warfare series. It's a, I'm not going to say lighthearted, but it's a, a different way to look at spiritual warfare. This morning we're going to be talking about the, the reality of spiritual warfare, the reality <coughs> of the fact that Satan desires to rip you apart. We're going to be looking at that. That's why uh, the lion is the, uh, the topic of the, uh, the, the face of this series. I think everybody could agree with me on this statement, life is tough. That's not news, it's not a special revelation, is it? In just the course of a normal life, we all have to deal with random and varied emotions. We all have to deal with victories and defeats. We all have to deal with struggles and triumphs. As, I as Zach was uh, giving his testimony this morning about going down this week, I, I um, uh, was praying for him as he went down. It was the first time he'd ever dealt with a situation like that as a pastor. And I prayed for him because it's tough. And even though you're going to take the good news to somebody, even though you're going to minister to somebody, we all know this, those of you who have been involved in ministry before, even though you're going to minister to somebody, it takes a lot out of you to do that. It takes a lot out of you to give of yourself to others. And their tough life affects your life. We all have to face disease and sickness of some kind at some point in our life. Death and loss, uncertainty and personal struggle. Many of us will have to deal with bullying in our lives, rejection, fear, and shame. Some of us will have to deal, deal with the shame of being the bully towards somebody else. We'll not only confront our own issues and problems that we have to deal with, but we'll also be confronted and have to deal with issues caused by others in our circle and those outside of our circle. And in the end, you die. <laughs> the bleak prospects of life can be daunting. They can be daunting enough, but you're, if you're a believer in Jesus, now hear me when I say this and really grasp what I'm saying here. Life can be tough enough, right? Life can be difficult enough. But if you're a believer in Jesus, you have the special added bonus of the fact that Satan desires to destroy you. Great. 
I thought when I accepted, how many of you have heard this? How many of you said this when you were young Christians before you really grew into the understanding of it? I thought when I became a Christian, life was going to be wonderful. It was going to be lollipops and candy corn. And anybody else like elephant uh, circus peanuts? Like the circus peanuts, those orange? I love those things. They are so bad for you. But I love that. And they're like, they're, yeah. But. I thought life was going to be like double stuff Oreos and circus. It's not, man. It is a brutal assault on your life every day. Every day. But you have something that even Satan doesn't. As a believer in Jesus Christ, even though life is tough, even though you have Satan attacking you and Satan having a plan. Remember we talked about that. We talked about this through our, through our series for the first part of the year. We talked about relationships building churches and how God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. No matter who you are, no matter how, who you think you are not in the eyes of God or how much you don't matter in church, you need to understand that God has a plan for your life. Not for you to fit in in some grand scheme with a group. God has an individual plan for you and for you. If this is the church that God has called you to, guess what? God has a plan for you to get involved in ministry in this church. But just like God has a plan for your prosperity and your growth and your benefit, Satan has a plan for your destruction, an individualized plan for your destruction. Our boys, uh, Gabriel and Michael, came out of the foster care system. They have PTSD. Uh, they were isolated for, for the first several years of their lives. They are now, get, they just finished kindergarten. And I, I shared with you a, lot, a while ago, they're reading. And you, I've, Aaron said something. Um, she spelled a word this morning, eat. She spelled the word eat, and Michael said, she spelled it out, E-A-T, and Michael said, eat. I'm like, yeah, cool, cool. It was a, just a shock that he, he said, oh, yeah, I know how to spell eat. He's like, I'm sure you do. And I hope when you turn 13, you and your brother forget what that word means. Because, because I don't want to pay that bill. But um, Gabriel and Michael, uh, they're very intelligent, very bright boys. They've made a lot of progress. But they're a little bit behind in reading. And because those of you who have dealt with kids that have PTSD or adults that have PTSD, their memory, their short-term memory is not very good. It's in, it's design, their, their body uses, their mind uses it as a defense mechanism. They forget. So... They, they forget what they learned yesterday in school. So what we did with the counselors is come up with an individualized plan. They don't have an IEP yet, but they have an individualized plan where they work with one-on-one -on -one with reading specialists. Individually, a, design, a specially designed program for them. Don't you know that Satan, Christian, Satan has an individually designed program to destroy your life. He doesn't want you to succeed. He doesn't want you to see the value in yourself. He doesn't want to see you to see the value in you being in church. He doesn't want you to see the value in reaching out and reaching this world that needs Jesus Christ more than they need anything else. He wants to destroy you. But you have something that even Satan doesn't have on your side. You have God. You have the power of the creator of all the universe. You have access to the wisdom of the ages, to the king of kings, the lord of lords, and every ounce of power that his being contains. We're going to look at that, and we're going to see that through this series. What you have access to. Now, God wants to be there for you. He's ready, he's willing, and he's able to fight for you. He did for Noah, he did for Abraham, he fought for Moses, he fought for Paul, he fought for Peter, and he wants to fight for you. But just like a kid on the sidelines, just like a kid on the sidelines at the playground, you have to pick Jesus to come into the game. You have to bend your will to his. You have to give yourself over to him and choose to follow his way. You have to choose to appropriate his power in your life. When you do, if you pick him to be your defender, 
Ephesians 3.20 will be true in your life. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Do you know that you cannot even imagine the power and authority and the victory that God has for you? His word says you can't even, you can't even imagine the blessings I have for you. You can't even imagine what I can do for you. All you need to do is sit back and watch. Now, let me get pretty personal, a little bit, a little bit tough here, a little bit of tough love to start this off. There's never a valid reason for a Christian to be defeated. There's never a cause for a child of God to be discouraged. There's never a godly reason to fall or fail. There's never a time or situation that cannot be overcome for the glory of God, except for the fact that we're human. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall. But the Bible clearly tells us, and we'll see this verse as we get into this, every situation, every trial, every temptation that comes into your life, there is a way out of it. There is a successful way out of it. Everyone. Everyone, Pastor John? Everyone. That's what the Bible says. Part of the, part of the problem is you need to first accept the full authority of the Word of God. That the Bible means what it says and says what it means. And that you can trust it for everything in your life. See, the fact that you're human is the fly in the ointment. We're the ones that have to carry out God's plan in our lives. We have to face the difficulties. We have to fight the battles. We have to overcome the temptations. And we're human. And Satan is our adversary. Let's go ahead and read um, our text. 1 Peter chapter 5. This, uh, this is written by Peter. We just, now we just spent about three weeks talking about the relationship that Peter had with Jesus Christ and seeing that special relationship and then seeing some of the amazing things that Peter did. Last week, you remember, we ended our, ser our, our, ser our, our long series on relationships building churches with the restoration of Peter. After Peter denied Jesus Christ three times the, day be the, the night before he was crucified, just hours before Jesus died, Peter denied three times that he even knew him. Well, here's what Peter writes about Satan and what Satan wants to do to you. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. Actually, let's start at verse 6. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Man, if you underline or highlight in your Bible, that's a great phrase to underline. He cares about you. Here we go, verse 8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. That's where we're going to stop. Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I had thought for a little bit, just a short bit, because I knew it wasn't, wasn't going to be the thing to do, but I had thought about putting some lion attacks up on the screen in videos so we could see. Uh, you can watch that on YouTube on your own if you have the stomach for it, because it's not pretty. Um, but man, when a lion attacks, it is not. It's not with like a knife and fork and napkin tucked in his mane. It's brutal. And I think it's very telling that Peter uses a roaring, hunting, devouring lion to compare the attack of Satan to. Because that's, Satan doesn't just want to trip you up. He doesn't just want to make you have a bad day. He wants to devour you. He wants to annihilate you. He wants to take you out of the game completely. Satan, get this straight, man. Satan does not want you to be a part of God's plan anymore. He wants you to give up. He wants you to walk away. He wants you to stay away. And he doesn't want you to ever speak the name of Jesus Christ again. Oh, that's kind of, that's like hyperbole there, Pastor John. No, it's not. You don't understand. Satan hates you. He has no love for you whatsoever. All these cute little games that people play and all these things, when, we, when, when Christians dabble in, in the occult, are you out of your mind? I'm off track here, but I'm just going to say this. Are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? You're dabbling in the occult? Do you not know that that is Satan's territory? Satan is trying to get into you and trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy your home. He's trying to destroy your family. He's trying to destroy your marriage. He's trying to destroy everything about you and about God in your life. 
and we're going to get into some things that he uses and how we need to protect ourselves and prepare ourselves uh, for that. Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? One way you can, you can understand that verse a little bit more is, if God is for us, why does it matter who's against us? Right? Why does it matter who's against us? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's up against us, because in the end, we win. It's a guarantee. With God, you always win. If you follow God's plan, you always win. So if God is for you, why not continue on when it's a guaranteed win? And that's what this sermon series is all about, survival of the fittest. In the animal kingdom, there are predators and there are prey. The strength, the wisdom, the cunning, the preparation and defenses that each employ throughout the day, every day of their lives, determines the outcome of their battles for survival. What we're going to be looking at in this series, as I said, is different safari animals, big game animals. Animals that, have, that, that are considered a prize and what their, what their tactics are, what their defense mechanisms are, what they do to make themselves an easier target. We're going to be looking at these things and how they, how they work together. Let me give you a, a quick story. Um, my grandson Desmond, uh, when he was just a little boy, just maybe two or three years old, I went out to Springfield, Missouri. And uh, I visited him, and I took him to the zoo. I love the zoo. I, I just love the zoo. And I took Desmond to the zoo. And that zoo happens to have an elephant paddock, a lot of elephants. And there was a baby elephant there. And me being, you know, fun grandpa, whatever, poppy, uh, I sat Desmond on the rail. Like I said, he was only two or three at the time. And I said, Desmond, what, what noise, what sound does a lion make? And Desmond started roaring and growling. And I'm, you know, I said, I started roaring and growling too. Did you know, this is truth, man, did you know those elephants, the adult elephants, circled around that baby elephant to protect it? And they looked at me, I was terrified. I was like, okay, time to get a hot dog, right? <laughs> Wow. I'll jump ahead a little bit and give you a, one of the one of the main reasons you get the in your life by Satan is because you isolate yourself. You don't allow yourself to be encircled by your brothers and sisters in Christ when you're weak. It is okay to admit you're weak. It is okay to admit that you're human. It's okay to admit that you make mistakes and you fall. It's also okay to admit that you need help. It's all right. It's okay. It doesn't make you worse than anybody else. It doesn't make you weaker. In fact, it shows that you have a strong understanding of success according to the word of God. Now, before we get to the animals themselves, there are some very basic practices that we must understand about spiritual warfare. And we may or may not get through this message this week. We might have to finish it next week. That's okay. Uh, I know the guy that prepares the sermons. And he said we can make this a two-week sermon if we need to. <laughs> um, we need to look at some of these, some of these, uh, some of the ways that the Bible talks about spiritual warfare and the reality of it. Understand it and understand what the Bible says because we must be prepared. Doesn't doesn't matter a bit if you go to church if you don't know how to use what you learn there. And that's what we're talking about in this sermon, some practical things about Satan. And the goal for a Christian, by the way, is to defeat Satan in your life. So what we're going to be looking at is this. How do you defeat Satan? How do you defeat Satan in your life on a daily basis? Now, don't think that just because you beat him today, you're not going to have to fight him again tomorrow. He's not going to walk away. He's not going to say, oh, well, that Christian learned the secret. Oh, we'll leave him alone. He's going to go back, he's going to redouble his effort and come after you. There's no doubt about it. This is a constant battle, a constant war that you're going to have to face as you fight spiritual battle against Satan to win and to live your life as a godly person and to reach this world for Jesus Christ. That's what's at stake. 
you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your Savior, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the first thing you must that's all that's all just that's all just stories and fables in the Bible. Come on, that's not real. Go ahead. Think that. Think that. And when you are laying on your back, looking up, gasping for air, spiritually speaking. Because you have just had the ever-loving snot kicked out of you in a spiritual battle. Maybe you'll believe then. But I'm telling you, man, spiritual battle is, spiritual warfare is real. It is real. Satan is real. And as I said, Satan has a plan. Movie, uh, The Usual Suspects, Kevin Spacey, made a very, an excellent statement. His character said, The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. Did you know that over, I think it's around 60% of Americans today do not believe in the reality of Satan? And that's that's understandable because people people that don't know Jesus Christ, it's probably not even something they, they think about very often. But when it gets really scary is this. Around 40% of all people who claim to know Jesus Christ as their Savior don't believe Satan exists. Wow. Okay. Wow. Then, you know what? Let me ask you a question. If you're here this morning, you don't think he exists. If you don't think Satan exists, let me ask you a question. Why are you here? What's the point? What's the point? See, what I'm saying is a choice needs to be made in your life. A battle needs to be fought in your life, and if there's no Satan, if there's only God and he's and everything's good and eventually love wins and everybody gets there and now all the happy stuff, what are you here for? Like the Bible says in James, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you're going to die. What's the point? The point is this, there's a battle for your, for your life. There's a battle for the souls of the lost going on. Satan doesn't want them in here and he doesn't want you to be successful. Therefore, he's very happy if people don't believe he exists. He can work in the background without a problem at all. Understand this about Satan. He hates everything to do with God. He hates everything to do with God. He's arrogant, arrogant and prideful. He thought he could get Jesus Christ to fall into sin. Jesus created Satan. Remember, the Bible says, you read the Old Testament, Isaiah, he created Lucifer. Lucifer was the most powerful created angel in all of heaven. He got cocky, he got arrogant, he thought he wanted to be God. Does that sound like a lot of us in our lives? We may not say we are going to take over heaven, but we say, I want to be God in my life, and I want to choose my own path, I want to do my own thing, just like Satan said. Satan said, I will be like the most high God. And he battled against God. And he lost the battle. And him and a third of all the angels that were ever created were kicked out of heaven. And they came down to this realm. And the Bible says Satan is the prince of the power of the air. This is where he operates. This is where he operates. He hates everything to do with God. He wants God's place. He wants to be God. Included in that hatred is you. Why? Because you, like it or not, Christian, you represent the very deep love of God. The essence of God is love. The Bible says God is love. Many times in the New Testament, especially in the, in the books that John wrote, he talks about God being love and all about God is love. Everything that God does for you, even the chastising, even the correction he brings in your life is all about love. You represent the amazing love of God. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for your sins. You represent the deep, amazing, graceful love of God. 
Satan hates that, and he hates you. You are a target. Believe that. You are a target. There's no doubt about it. You are a target. But understand this. You need to realize that you can win. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. We've, we've just come through a very, very tough, I mean, a months-long attack on our family. And it feels like we've, we've kind of come out of the darkness and we're breathing a little bit of fresh air. But I've started, as soon as, as soon as I felt that break, and if there, anybody who's ever been under a spiritual assault, you'll understand what I mean. When that breaks, when that, when that attack breaks, you feel a freedom. Now, I thanked God for it. I thanked him for the freedom. I thanked him for the respite from that. But I immediately began praying that he would place a hedge on me individually because I know Satan's not just going to walk over. Oh, that one didn't work. He's coming again. He's coming again. You're a target. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 37. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you not know that Satan knows exactly what Romans 8, 37 through 39 says? He knows that. But it doesn't mean that he's not going to do his dead level best. Why does God encourage us that nothing can separate us? Because there are things that are trying to separate us. Satan is trying to separate you from the love of God. He's trying to get you to turn your back on God, to walk away, to give up. Because if you do then that is one less soldier in the battle for the souls of others. So we must accept the truth about spiritual warfare. The second thing we must do is this. We must pray. We must pray. Pray, pray, pray. The least used weapon in the arsenal of the Christian is prayer. Maybe you've said this. I've had people say it to me. Surprisingly, people who are, um, are looked at as um, mature Christians, spiritually, they've said, I only pray for the big stuff. I only pray for the big stuff. I, I, every time I talk about prayer, until the day I, God calls me home, up until the last message I preach, if I talk about prayer, I will always use my father as an illustration. Because my dad is an amazing man of prayer. My dad prayed when I was growing up. We had, I remember the blue, I don't know, I forget what it was. It didn't have a back seat. Remember? And then we had cushions. And a, yeah, okay, this was long before, like, reality. Okay? We, <laughs> shut up, Emma. We had, <laughs> tells you how old I am. There was no back seat in this car. They, we had like couch cushions that we put in there, right? And I mean, to look at it nowadays, you wouldn't even call it a beater because it didn't have a back seat, right? My dad brought that home. It was like, Dad, are we going to get this car? Because we thought, I thought it was cool, no back seat. That's awesome. I was nine, right? He looked at me, he says, John, I'm praying about it. Dad, this cool car, look at this, man, this is awesome. There's no back seats. I'm praying about it. My dad prays about everything. My dad prays about buying a used car. Why? Because my father taught me, and he believes with all his heart, that God has a plan for your life, and God wants to lead you in every decision, and God has the best for you in every decision of life, and the way you find out God's best is by praying and asking about it. You know, I loved that car. We bought it. I loved that car. It was a lot of fun. Nowadays, we'd get arrested. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. 
Christian, you need to pray. How you defeat Satan? Prayer. You need to pray. You will never go wrong by praying about everything. Nothing is made worse in your life by prayer. You understand that? It's like an extra scoop of ice cream. What has ever been made worse with an extra scoop of ice cream? Right? <laughs> in my life, nothing. You can tell. All right? Especially if that has some kind of chocolate chip in it. All right? Nothing in your life is made worse by prayer, folks. Everything is made better. In fact, you will see life clearer if you pray. Understand, prayer empowers and energizes everything in your life. Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Psalm 34.15, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. Psalm 5.3, listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Luke 11.9, so I tell you, Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Pray in your life. You want to defeat Satan in your life? You want to find the way of escape? You want to get out of the situation you're in? You want victory in your life as a Christian? Pray about it. Pray about it. Pray about it. The third thing we need to do is this. We need to armor up need to armor up. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Protect yourself at all times. When I, when I pray, especially when I get ready to preach, I literally, honestly, I literally pray on the armor of a Christian. I say, God, I'm taking on the helmet of salvation. God, I'm strapping on the breastplate of righteousness. God, I'm wrapping my, uh, my uh, vital organs with the belt of truth. Truth. I love the fact that truth is, is, uh, is represented by the belt because that is your core. And truth has to be at your core. God, I'm pulling on the boots of preparation. I'm taking up the sword of the Spirit and I'm putting on my other arm the shield of faith because, God, I'm going into battle right now and I want to be protected. I want to be protected, Lord. You have to be. Our weapons are not physical. They're spiritual. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Did you know that you are the connection between somebody and Jesus Christ? Did you know that? People don't just want... Think about how you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Who connected you? Who made that connection for you? You are the connection for somebody. There's somebody out there needing Jesus Christ, and you are the connection between you, between them and God. The weapons you fight that battle to defeat Satan for their soul... They're not physical. They're spiritual. You can't buy them. They're spiritual weapons. Ephesians 6, 13 and 18. I've already mentioned these, but let's go ahead and read it. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the, evil, in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to start, stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And lastly, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Armor up, Christian. Armor up. Live these truths every day. Make yourself stronger in them. Ask God to increase your faith. Ask God to increase your endurance. Ask God to help you understand and accept truth. Part of the problem we fail so much in our lives is because we don't believe the Word of God to be the Word of God. 
we don't believe the word of God completely. We don't accept the fact that we need God's help. We're a little bit too human. Next, we must know the enemy's strategies. You've got to know the enemy's strategies, man. When I was in the army, uh, we used to have what was, I'm sure they still do, you can ask Jonathan or Johnny, um, the Marines, I have a little trouble with the written word, but they, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, a little bit of the, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure that um, Johnny and, and Jonathan, uh, just like me back in the day, uh, went through op four training, it's opposing forces. Now, when I was in, uh, back in the early 80s, the Russians were our big, the Soviet Union was our big enemy, and that's who we prepared against. Uh, the battle doctrine that was developed for us, and the one that we learned, and the one that we learned from the Soviets, about the Soviets, was the battle doctrine from them. So in order to be able to prepare ourselves and defend ourselves and fight a successful battle, we needed to, we needed to know what our enemy planned for us. The Russians were a mechanized infantry. They, uh, they traveled around in uh, APCs, and there was usually a squad of 10 to 12. You know, what the, you know what the easiest way to take out a Russian squad was? To look and find the officer. Because if you could take the officer out, nobody else knew how to take charge. In the Army, and I'm sure it's the same in the Marines and the Navy, when it, and the Air Force, anybody, who, if there's two military members walking together, whoever has the higher rank is in charge. Or whoever, ha if, if you're the same rank, if you're both uh, sp uh, spec fours, whoever entered the military first was the one in charge. There's always somebody, and if, and if you entered at the same time, you do rock, paper, scissors. Right? Um, <laughs> there's always a chain of command to follow. Somebody is always in charge. Why? Because the United States military builds and develops leadership. And somebody, we know that in war, people go down all the time. And somebody needs to step up and take over. Does that sound familiar about church? We disciple our people. We grow Christians. Why? Because someday, we're not going to be here. Someday, somebody's going to need to step in and take our place. Just like in the military. The Russians didn't do that. The Russians had one officer and 10 Indians or 10, 10 soldiers. If you took out the officer, nobody else knew what to do. Nobody else knew the plan. That was part of our op four training. That was part of our uh, battle doctrine. Take out the leader. They showed us videos. I was in military intelligence. They showed us videos of the Soviet army uh, truck driver training. Some of these guys, Jeannie kind of chuckled at that. I'm sure she's seen those. Some of those guys had never, ever, ever seen a motorized vehicle. Us, by the time I went to basic training, now I had my driver's license, but even somebody who didn't have a driver's license had probably gone to a go-kart track or driven a, uh, a lawnmower around their yard. So you had some concept of what it meant to drive a vehicle. They had none, none whatsoever. My point is this, in order to defeat the Soviets in battle, we needed to know as much as we could about how they fought and what they intended to do to us. Does that make sense? When it comes to battling Satan, we must know the enemy's tactics. We need to know his strategies. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We're not ignorant of his schemes. Realize that people, circumstances, and feelings are all part of Satan's strategies. Realize that people, circumstances, and feelings are all part of Satan's strategies. I remember the um, first, first, first Bible college I went to, Maranatha Baptist Bible College out in Watertown, Wisconsin. Dr. Myron B. Cedarholm was the president of that college. And he would say, 
to, when, when we had a preacher boys class, say, preacher boys, I don't feel saved until I've had my first cup of coffee in the morning. Feelings. Feelings. How often do feelings dictate how you feel about God, how you feel about your faith, how you feel about your spouse, how you feel about people in your life? How often do you allow your feelings about a cert, at a certain time, about a certain situation, dictate how you're going to respond and act during that day? Discouragement and doubt are some of his weapons. Satan will use discouragement and doubt to try to defeat you. Unreliable, gossiping, drama-filled friends are some of his weapons. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens the countenance of another. Let me ask you a question. How much sharpening do you think is done when you sit around talking about everybody else and picking everybody else apart with your friends? How much do you think, how much sharpening do you think goes on when you annihilate everybody in the world and are nothing but negative on Facebook? Oh, Pastor John, you didn't bring Facebook into this now. Seriously. When you are nothing but negative, when you do nothing but speak negative about others and gossip about others and pick others apart, oh, but they're my friend. Oh, I need somebody to vent to. Vent to God. Show me in the Bible where the Bible says you need to vent and gossip about others just to get it out of your system. It's not there. You see, that's where you don't, we don't believe the word of God completely. Oh, I need somebody to, you've got God. You've got God. What good do you do by poisoning somebody else's well? Seriously. Seriously. You don't do any good. You tear down. Who do you think motivates that? Satan. It's one of his tactics, folks. Because, see, when you start gossiping and you listen to gossip about somebody else, let's be honest. Now, you don't have to, you don't have to affirm this or shake your head or respond in any way. But how many of you have listened to gossip about somebody else and thought better of that person because of it? Seriously. You've listened to gossip about somebody else. You've listened to the negativity about somebody else and you've thought better of them because of what you heard. You see, what Satan is trying to do is tear down the fabric of relationship, trying to tear down the unity that you have because the Bible says that the church... Satan cannot defeat the church, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church as long as we're unified. But he wants to destroy the fabric of our unity. He does that by turning one against the other. <laughs> Let's move off that one. Disappointment and isolation are some of his weapons. Disappointment and isolation. I've been very transparent with you as the pastor. I'm going to disappoint you at some point in life. You're not going to like what I think about something. You're not going to like how I approach something. You're not going to like how we do something. Uh, you know, we're making a lot of renovations, a lot of changes. That room that, the, that uh, Jonathan and, and uh, what's your name again, Jeremy? Uh, he's, only, he's only my nephew, I'm sorry. And, and Cliff and, and Zach and I, we stained something. We put stain up and I cleaned up the trash. I cleaned up the trash. <laughs> Don't let me near power tools, I'm serious. Um, but that room, man, that's been a vision for years. For a long time, I've wanted to see that happen. And now we've got individuals who are taking over and doing that. It's called, if you, have, if you don't know yet, it's called the Safe House Cafe. Safe House Cafe. And that, there's going to be a coffee in there, internet. It's going to be a place where you can come during the week if you just need a place to go and read, a safe space to go and read and to study your Bible or to sit down and have a conversation and a cup of coffee with a friend, you're going to be able to come here once that room's done. No lie. Isolation is a tactic of Satan. He wants to stop you from getting together. He wants you to be disappointed. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Maybe you don't like some of the changes we're making here. Okay, that's fine. Might not be your cup of tea. You might be a Keurig instead of a Sanka person. I don't know. Maybe you don't like it. Can I just tell you something? 
and this is with no arrogance or pride or power hungry anything. I appreciate your feelings, but we're going to go ahead with the project anyway. All right? So you now have a choice to make. You can either be happy that your church is moving forward, doing something to be relevant in the community, to reach people, and that's what this is about. Man, you can bring your friend. Do you know that on Saturday mornings we have an exercise class that meets in that? They don't go to our church. I don't even know if most of them are believers in Christ. How else are we going to get them onto the property? Hey, this Saturday, this Saturday we have a car show coming up. That's going to be cool. That's going to be pretty cool. It's not about the cool cars. There's like a Puerto Rican club that's going to be here with low riders. I'm digging that. That's my stuff, yeah. Did you know that a lot of those people may never have been to church and may not have anything to do with church at all? or want to have anything to do with church, getting them here, getting them on the property to see that we're not people that like bat, bite the heads off bats and sacrifice goats and things like that, that we're pretty, nor we're pretty normal people. We just believe, we just, we just dig Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. Now, maybe that, that's not the way you were raised. Maybe not that's, that's not the way you would do it, but it's the way we do it. It's the philosophy of this church. It's the philosophy of ministry that we incorporate because we want to reach our community. Relationships build churches. You have a choice to make. You can either be upset about it and allow it to divide you from your friends and your church, fellow church members, thus dividing you from God and causing the church to be weaker. Or you can say, you know what? It's not necessarily my thing, but at least we're doing something. And I'd rather my church have growing pains than dying pains. So I'm just going to jump on board and enjoy myself. And maybe someday, that crazy, weird, bald guy up front might take an idea that I have and put it into practice. That's me, by the way. <laughs> you weird, bald guy. <laughs> Folks, don't let Satan isolate you and get in and divide you from each other. It's a tactic of Satan. And when you're with your friends, make sure that you speak life. Speak life. Not death. Not destruction. Speak life to other people. So that there will be unity in the body of Christ. So the body of Christ will grow. We're going to stop right there. Because we can. Right? And we'll pick this up next week. I'm challenging you this week, folks, to do two things. The first one is this. Look around in your life and try to identify the negative things that happen in your life that maybe could be possibly be satanic attacks and influences on your life to try to get you discouraged and down. Maybe you haven't bought in completely to this whole spiritual warfare thing. Humor me a little bit for a week, will you? And start looking at life a little bit differently and incorporate that with the second thing. Start praying about it. God, open my eyes to the spiritual attacks that go on in my life every day. Listen, man, I know, I know, I know, I know that when the moment I get behind the wheel of a car, Satan is going to put somebody in front of me that doesn't know how to drive. <laughs> right? Right? Now, they probably know how to drive. I'm just, I'm just that guy that thinks the road is designed and developed for me. I'm like a truck driver, Charlie. I think the road is all about me. So I know that my day can be detoured by a driver that may not fit my qualifications of being a competent driver. Right? That's just the way it is. Start praying and asking God to open your eyes to reveal to you what goes on in your daily life from little things to big things that cause, that are spiritual attacks and spiritual assaults trying to rob you of your joy and your effectiveness as a believer. Does that sound fair? It's not hard. It's not a hard, it's not a hard, um, uh, homework assignment, right? 
Just do those things and see if, if your eyes start opening up to what is going on in your life to try to destroy you and take you away from your walk with Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you so much for your uh, compassion to us. Lord, the way that you love us. Thank you for being such a good, good father to us. Lord, just like that video, Father, so many of us are tired and worn. And God, Satan attacks and assaults us. Sometimes, Lord, we don't even realize it. We don't even know it. We don't even give him credit for it. Lord, would you open our eyes, allow us to see the world through your eyes. Allow us to see our lives through your eyes. God, teach us what this is all about. Help us to know and understand what it is that you want us to about this whole spiritual warfare thing, Lord. Help us to be better soldiers, more competent, better trained, Lord, that we might be able to fight this battle and war this war successfully for you because that's what it's all about. God, there are people out there that need to hear your message. They need to feel your love, God, just like we did. Lord, help us to fight hard. Help us to stand strong and stand firm against Satan, against his attacks. Help us to recognize them, Lord, so that we can be, be ready and we can be successful. Take us from this place as worshipers, Lord, and may we do your will this week. In your precious name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Just before you leave, we're going to ask a few individuals to come up and take up our morning offering. Listen, I know we have several guests with us. If you're a guest with us this morning, we don't ask you to participate here. This is not your responsibility. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. If you choose to, to participate in the offering, that's great. Uh, we're not going to give the money back. <laughs> but um, please don't feel obligated. Uh, we're just so thankful that you're here. Once the plate passes you, you are dismissed. Have a great week. Just before you leave, we're going to ask a few individuals to come up and take up our morning offering. Listen, I know we have several guests with us. If you're a guest with us this morning, we don't ask you to participate here. This is not your responsibility. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. If you choose to, to participate in the offering, that's great. Uh, we're not going to give the money back. <laughs> but um, please don't feel obligated. Uh, we're just so thankful that you're here. Once the plate passes you, you are dismissed. Have a great week. Great week. Great week.